Welcome to the Office Hours Podcast. This is TK Coleman and Isaac Morehouse. We're like the geek squad for your professional development. Got a job you're trying to get? A work-related issue you're trying to resolve? A project you're trying to complete? An obstacle that's holding you up? Well, you're in the right place. You bring the problem, we bring the nuts and bolts. This is where you get philosophical insight and actionable advice on how to take charge of your life and career. Don't be bitter because your girl follow me on Twitter. <laughs> oh, we actually live. <laughs> We're live. <laughs> We're live. <laughs> Pull it together. <laughs> well, we like to pretend that it's live. We don't do second takes here <laughs> on the Office Hours podcast, and we are live. TK, what happens if the teleprompter messes up? Do you go off script? Yeah, I just... Uh... <laughs> we don't actually have a teleprompter. That would be kind of fun, though, if we did. Um, hey, man, I'm coming in cold. I didn't even look at the notes you sent me because it's kind of crazy. Well, you sent them like 20 minutes ago. <laughs> and I've got... I'm with uh, all four of my kids. I've got them for a whole week, and my wife is out of town, out of state, yeah. halfway across the country. So I'm like at home, and I'm trying to work from home, which isn't working too well, but... We're having a good time, but I was on the way. I was dropping the girls off at a friend's house yeah. so that I could get away and record this. Yeah. And uh, oh shoot, I wonder where the baby is. I kind of forgot about him. No, just kidding. Just kidding. He's taking a nap. He's good. Not by himself. Anyway, <laughs> he's got a babysitter. So I'm dropping the girls off, and they said, "I said I got to go in the office for a little bit." And they said, "What for?" I said, "Well, I'm doing a podcast with TK." And they were like, "Is it a, on YouTube?" And I'm like, "Oh God, yes, it's on YouTube." <laughs> and they said, "My daughter goes, uh, my younger daughter goes, you." You have a YouTube channel? And I said, well, there's a Praxis channel. She goes, is it popular? And I said, <laughs> I said, there's like a thousand subscribers. She goes, Dad, I want to come on it. Then everyone will love me. And I, and I, and I was like, well, maybe. And then, and then Eden goes, what do you, what do you make in your videos with TK? And I said, well, we talk about like Praxis and you know things like how to get a job and how to be valuable and learn skills. And she goes, boring. She goes, I thought you'd do like the Pringle challenge or something. And I was like, what's that? She's like, oh, you don't know what the Pringle challenge is? That's what everyone does on YouTube, and they get like a million followers. So. Apparently, we need to do the Pringle challenge. So I love that your youngest daughter somehow has already gotten the message that the key to love is being on camera. <laughs> She's totally right. <laughs> they will love me. <sighs> and then the oldest girl is already disappointed in you yeah. because you don't have the right kind of popularity. No, it's like clearly, she was like, clearly you're not focused on what the people want. She's like, Dad. Like YouTube, hello, Pringle Challenge, you gotta know. This is what's funny though with YouTube channels, and I don't wanna like, you know, kids these days ramble too long, but I find it universally with all the parents that I know, whether their kids are like five or 10 or 12, they all love all these various YouTubers that they follow. Yeah. And the ones that they follow, it's like the most uninteresting, weird stuff. There's like entire channels where people just open toys, like open the packaging. Oh yeah, the unboxing. unboxing. Unboxing is huge, yeah. Well, and then there's like where kids bake and they just bake things badly. Like, oh, we're gonna mix this and then we make this. And it's just kind of like really lo-fi like video or ones where people just say like, okay, I'm gonna flip this water bottle 10 times in a row. And like all my nephews will watch it and just think it's amazing. <laughs> it's, it's hilarious. Like with all the technology available, all the ability to make amazing graphics and all this stuff. <laughs> the things that our children love uh, on YouTube are things that like weren't even funny on America's home video, you know, funniest home videos in like 1984. Maybe everything needs a first round, right? Like, so we got to do everything at least once. So the video flipping over the water bottle has to be made. And now you can't do that again. You won't be able to get attention like that again. It'll get more creative as we go along. What do you think about that hypothesis? You mean like that this is the, a thing because YouTube is still in the relatively early days? It, it, it's in the early days, particularly w w with like that <clears throat> generation, right? So this is their first go round. Hmm. So they're going to get all the goofy stuff out of the way. But now in, in two years, let's say, the kid flipping over the water bottle won't be able to get those views. It'll have to be something different, and it'll just get better and better. Well, maybe. I, I think there's something to that that I find pretty plausible. Because I, I don't think that YouTube itself as a consumption good is in the early enough days to where it'd be sure. like, wow, this is a new thing. I can make a video of my, like, that was like the early days of the camcorder, you know, which like we had a big one on your shoulder. Um, but I wonder if, because it is in the early days of 
everybody having the ability to create something and upload it to YouTube. So even when YouTube started- And be like a celebrity for it. Well, it was just the ability to do it alone. So like all of my nieces and nephews have YouTube channels. They're like eight, 10, six, whatever. And uh, they just make videos all the time and upload them. And they don't, they don't, there's no barrier anymore because they all have like, you know, their parents' old cast off iPhone that's not hooked up anymore, but they can use the camera or whatever and upload stuff. And so I think the fact that they Mm. can do it I'm wondering if that's part of what attracts them to YouTube channels where they see people doing things that they could do. It's mm. not too far removed. It's not like if mm. you watch one that's so highly produced. Yeah. As a kid, you don't even know what that means. Like, what are they? What tools are they using? Yeah. I don't. It's too unrelatable. That's that's like entertainment. You go to the movie theater and you watch something like that. But YouTube, they kids seem to like people who are only a year or two older than them and who are doing things only a little more advanced than they are. You know, if if yeah. you're if they're doing the the floss or whatever the cool dance is these yeah, days yeah, yeah. from Fortnite, they want to see someone who does it just a little better. But it's like I could do that, right? It's like yeah. in the I don't know. That's one theory I have. Yeah, yeah, that may be true. All right, so here's a, a separate thought I've been thinking about, and your first point actually kind of contradicts it a little bit, but it's it's a theme inspired by recent listenings to Wayne Dyer called. Um, being better than the good expectations of others. And I've been thinking about I've this. I've heard you say that phrase a number of times. That's Wayne Dyer, that's not you. I think, I don't know. I don't know if the phrase is me Did or Wayne Did I just Wayne break I, your heart? No, like I, I, I <laughs> All can, this time I was so inspired and now I found out you were a fraud. <laughs> no, I, I confuse myself with Wayne Dyer all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to say with Wayne Brady because that would work too. <laughs> be, be, be better than the good expectations of others. It's a phenomenal quote that for some reason has come up in a lot of our conversations. Yeah. So, so what has you thinking about it this go around? Yeah, okay. So Wayne Brady. <laughs> Obviously, do, doing the TK's tour, I've been focusing a lot on this idea of people having dreams and then having to deal with the opposition and skepticism of people that you know see those dreams as threatening. And I think that's a theme that most people relate to, even if it has to be taken outside of the context of college and opting out and so forth. Um, the, the, the trope that we're most familiar with is the great enemy of dreams is um, opposition, people who don't get it. But I actually think a more sinister, a more subtle, and perhaps a more pervasive enemy of dreams might be the ease with which the people in your life can easily accept you Mm. if you don't become who you need to be. So the idea of being better than the good expectations of others is basically this. The notion is that who you need to be in order to realize your own potential, your full potential, is vastly greater than who other people need you to be in order to be all right by them. Mm. So let's say, for instance, that my dream in life is to be like an Academy Award winning actor. Like, that's who I need to be for me. Um, My wife doesn't need me to be that. You don't need me to be that. Right, like if, if I yeah. never, <laughs> you're like, ah, I gotta be honest. I, I've been very patient. <laughs> it's like the friendship equivalent of a gold digger. I'm like waiting, like when is this gonna happen? You're like, no, we're only cool because I still got faith that you know maybe in the next couple of years you can make something happen. <laughs> but like my wife, my friends, my family, <clears throat> no one needs me to succeed. No one needs me to succeed at Praxis. No one needs me to improve my income. No one needs me to do anything different as long as I am who I need to be for them. Yeah. And who I need to be for them is basically a good friend. You know, I keep the agreements that I make with them. It's pretty easy. And so the things you know about yourself, those things are kind of a secret. And even if you tell them to people, they can't quite grasp it with the inner understanding that you have. And so in order to realize your potential, you have to go beyond the, the, the easy satisfaction that other people have with who you currently are. Because other people won't be heartbroken if you don't achieve your dreams. So which there's two elements of that that I, that I immediately think of and have experienced. I think most of us have. And I'm curious from you, which one of these two sides of that mm. presents the biggest challenge? So one side would be easy praise. Mm-hmm. So it's a challenge when you get love too easily, then you're going to keep chasing the thing that gives you that love, even if it's something that doesn't challenge you enough or isn't true to what you want to be. So let's say you and I making this podcast, let's say we start talking about, 
I don't know, some topic that we're not super interested in. And we get tons of tons of fans and people just loving it and saying how great it is. But we know we're not pushing ourselves and challenging ourselves, yeah. right? So yeah. the sort of the poison of compliments and love, but I don't mean that like it's poison, it's a very strong word, but the I guess the 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 velvet covered handcuffs, the soft shackles, that all of a sudden well, yeah. now we feel like we can't break away from the thing that's giving us the love, right? So that's yeah, yeah, one yeah. element. And the other element is the element that takes the sting of failure away. So if if mm. if you're like, I'm so mad at myself, I need to do more, I need to be better. And someone says, No, you don't. You're okay as yeah, you are, yeah. right? Which of those do you find most potentially dangerous? For me personally, that latter one. Yeah. Right? Because that, that latter one is something that I'm susceptible to believing. Like when I when I get the easy praise, yeah. I, I know if I'm not on. It feels a little wrong, right? Yeah, it feels yeah, like yeah. pounding a bunch of sugar and you're like, the energy's fake. You <laughs> right, know, like right, you kind of right. know. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm the same way. Yep. So, but but for me, it, it's more of a, um, when people are like, no, man, you're, you're just fine. Part of me needs to hear that at times, right? But But there's another part where it's kind of like, it makes me doubt myself. You know what? Maybe I am being too hard on myself. So as a matter of fact, Make it a little personal here. Here's an example of, of, of me and you with that. So, <laughs> so, so just before this show started, Isaac has told me that I was a complete loser. And the thing is, I don't even feel bad about it. This is like one of those like call out passive aggressive. Yeah, I mean, moments. sometimes you mean to me, but I mean, like I, I stay positive. You know, like I, I can get through a day. <laughs> you know, for, for real, for real. What, what's the example? So one example would be. Um, I think, Do I come out looking good in this example? That's all, all I care about. <laughs> I, I think when it comes to me and reading, for instance, and I've, I've told you this before, I think you are convinced that I truly don't need to read another book. <laughs> I think the idea that I think I need to read at least like a thousand more is like frightening <laughs> to you. It makes you genuinely concerned. <laughs> but I know for me, it doesn't come from insecurity. It doesn't come from moral duty. My relationship to books is almost mystical. Like I need to read in order to like be happy and be my best self. It doesn't even matter if I'm learning. Mm-hmm. Like if I'm reading, like I am, I am my best self. I'm just so happy like that. Now, if I never read another book, most people in my life, especially you, would be like, dude, you're fine. Like you don't need you don't need to read another book. Just like take what you know and apply it. Just be confident. Just like trust what you know. Well, okay, in fairness, I wouldn't I wouldn't <laughs> do that. I would I would start to demand that you read. The only thing is I would select the books better. <laughs> That's the only thing. It's not so much reading. But, but, no, but I, I'm not trying to make it too specific no, no, about that. I, I get the point yeah, though. It's yeah. very, it's very much like I mean, most people have probably experienced something like this. Let's say you're you're on a diet or something. You're doing a really yeah. rigorous workout regimen, and you know you've done it faithfully twelve days in a row. And then one day it's coming to the end of the day. You don't feel well, and you're like, "Oh, I've missed it. I haven't done it yet. Oh, I really don't feel up to it. I got to get out of bed and do it." It's the person who loves you the most and who even respects you. Yep. And they're impressed by you. Who's yeah. going to say, "Hey, you've done it." 12 days in a row. You can take a day yes. off, right? Yes. And you say, ah, oh, you just gave me the freedom to take a day off, right? And yeah. it's like, yeah. and that's a dangerous thing. I actually yeah. find myself doing that to my son paradoxically because he, you know, the one thing that I'm always worried about is like, is he disciplined enough? Is he pushing himself enough? Because yeah. we give him a lot yeah. of freedom and all this stuff. But then on the other hand, when he when he creates this schedule, I was just talking to, to Hannah about this, our coworker, when he creates the schedule for himself, he's super rigid about sticking to it. And I'll be like, hey, do you want to go like go for a walk or whatever? Nope, I can't. I got to do this and this. I'm like, y- your schedule's flexible. You can do whatever you want. You-, you do great with it. Who cares? Like, and I find myself being like yeah. that dangerous <laughs> voice of you're good enough, you know? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, and, and there are moments in life where you kind of got to be dramatic about your goals. Mm-hmm. And, and you have to, w- w- when, you, when you attempt to make self-critique and you've got people in your life that are like, ah, you're fine. Like, maybe you're like, ah, I, I need to be in better shape. And the people in your life are like, dude, you look fine to me. And they really mean that. They're not just trying to make you feel mm-hmm. better. It's like, hey, based on who I need you to be in order to be happy, you look great to me. But maybe to yourself, you just feel out of shape and you know what you got to do. And you have to fight for that self-critique over the easy affirmation that comes from people that you love. And you got to be willing to be dramatic about it. So I know for me, when I did my daily blogging challenge for a full year, 
I had went like over 200 Never days. Never lost. <laughs> Never lost. <laughs> I had went like over 200 days, man. And, and th- there was a period where I had to get a surgery and I had to go to the hospital. And I was just like, man, I, I, I was in such bad shape when I was recovering. And I remember one time, you know, my wife is like, I think you can take a day off. And she was so right, right? And like you said, get thee behind me, Satan. <laughs> get thee behind me, Satan. <laughs> Lady, I ain't gonna let you steal my dreams. Delilah. <laughs> my wife tried to hold me down, man. I saw right through it. <laughs> I saw right through she, it. She changed your WordPress password when you were under for the surgery. <laughs> yeah. My wife tried to change my password. She tried to delete my blog. I said, you're not gonna stop me. <laughs> no, but she was right, and I totally get it. I would do the same to her. Yeah. But I had to make a choice and be like, nope. Like, I got to be legalistic about this one. I got to be dogmatic about this one. I said I'm going to go every day for a year. And even though this is over dramatic and maybe it's better to not, I'm going to stick with it because I know who I need to become and I know what I need to find out about myself. And that's more important to me than settling for how good I know I will be with others, how easily I can get away with this if I don't show up. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think it's a... It is a very challenging thing to to constantly think about who do I want to be and what is the more important. This is like we talked about in in last week's episode about knowing what you want is half the battle with social media or whatever, or more than half. I think I said 90%, so we'll stick with that. But just, you know, obviously I want to be liked. I want to make people happy. I want people to be proud of me. Those are all psychological benefits that I enjoy. But do I want those more than reaching my full potential. You know, it's like an athlete that leaves a team yeah. that loves him to go have a chance to win a championship or like an artist who changes styles when all the fans are like, but your other yeah. style was good and but I want to be challenged, right? And like, man, that's a hard thing. It's a hard thing. And the more people like you, the tighter that constraint can start to feel if you don't continually push back and expand and, and sort of keep the weeds out and keep your your area that you may potentially want to explore into as broad as you need it to be, you know? Oh, and, absolutely. And it's, not, and it's not because of rudeness, it's the opposite. It's because of compliments and, and positivity often. Yeah, and you were joking with the, the get thee behind me Satan uh, story, but why don't you give a little context because that actually captures it well. Right, so that's, that's uh, in the New Testament where um, Jesus says that to uh, as a Peter, right? Yeah. And, and it's when Peter, he, he has like a very nice, kind sounding, like, Jesus, you don't have to, to like, do Like, this. I'm going to protect you. Yeah, like, you it's don't okay. Have, yeah. Like, you, you know, you don't need to make this, hey, you don't need to suffer like this. And that, that's such a fascinating rebuke. Like, that's, I'm not even talking to you, Peter. I'm talking to Satan, which you could just say represents kind of the dream slayer, right? Yeah, the spirit yeah. of everything that wants to tell you, hey, you don't really need to do that. You don't really need, you don't to, need to work. You don't need to put yourself through that inconvenience. You're going to yeah. be okay. You know, just chill out a little bit. Take a day off, right? Yeah. yeah. All right, so I'm going to com- I'm, I'm gonna probably confuse our, our listeners right now by doing a roundabout. Um, is it a roundabout? About confused face? and amused. Well, I confuse myself. <laughs> I confuse myself. Okay, so. A, right. a roundabout what? I don't know. We're, we're talking about realize your full potential, right? Okay. You're trying to make a connection to your next topic? And nope, there's no, no, not at all, not at all. Okay. I, I, I didn't even know I was going to talk about this. I, I didn't even know I was going to talk about this. I'm off script. The tel- turn the teleprompter off. Turn it off. <laughs> all right, so here's a, a, an, an idea proposal. I want to play around with this concept. The notion of realizing your potential <clears throat> is actually a trap. And you shouldn't care about that idea at all. It, it mostly causes problems. Here's why. All that matters is that you live freely according to your definition of living of freedom. Um, to some degree, you can do that now, but because we all have constraints in our lives, there are some sacrifices you might have to make in order to expand your freedom. But at the end of the day, all that matters is that you live freely. The notion of realizing your potential, on the other hand, sets you up to be easily manipulated. It sets you up to be confused about what other people want of you, want from you, because it, it, it has this connotation of like, Isaac, you could be so much more than what you are. Um, and, 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 and it can it can get you stuck in this trap of thinking about what I what I am right now and what I could be. And I'm gonna say what you could be, the possibility of who you could become is doesn't matter at all unless you personally feel like it would make you more free. 
And if you feel it would make you more free, then pursue that because it makes you free, not because it's realizing your potential. That's irrelevant. I think I can get down with that. I, I, I think, I mean, you know that freedom is like my animating idea, you know, on a personal level, on a career-wise, professional level, everything. That's that's what motivates me. So I obviously resonate with anyone talking about, you know, becoming free as sort of the the ultimate yeah, yeah. constant struggle as, a, as an individual. And I guess I can see, you know, the way that we were talking about realize your potential, perhaps that language is too loose um, or it's not accurate. <clears throat> I guess I can see what you mean. If, if, this, if you have this idea that there's this thing called the version of me that I'm supposed to be or could be or yeah. ought to be, that that can be a tool used to confuse or manipulate or distract or cause stress. Think, think about all the people, for instance, who might say to you like, yeah, I appreciate what you're doing with Praxis and you know your company in Charleston, but man, you could be out in Silicon Valley, man. Like you know, like you're not you're not realizing your full potential. And for you, it's like that's not my full potential. Okay, that, so, that's something you think I could be doing that would be better. But I'm doing yeah, it the way I want to do. So, it. so I guess I would say I don't think the problem is the idea of coming into your full potential. It's allowing anyone else's definition of your full potential to replace your own, which is yeah, very subtle like I and can see happen. more for right. you than what you're, And, and yeah. I think with your own, you've got to know it's never something that's clearly in view 100%. It's, again, we've talked about yeah. this many times, mm-hmm. it's more like the chiseling process than it is the, the constructing process, right? Where yeah. you keep removing things. Like, I, I know that I don't like this feeling or this thing that I'm facing or this skill that I don't have. I gotta remove the obstacles to that and I'm gonna come closer and closer in into this kind of rough vision that gets clearer the more I move to it of yeah. what I can be, but making sure it's your vision of mm-hmm. your of your potential and that you are always, that's what freedom is. It's not that you're just kind of floating around. It's that you're on a path that's your path. And yeah. even if your path turns out to be wrong and you got to go backwards and take a different, it's yours, right? And yeah. that I think is where the real power is. And when someone else says, let me tell you what your real potential is. Now you can listen because they make yeah. give insight that you say, yeah. you know what, that resonates. There's something in that, but you can't you can't change to reach someone else's version of that. You've always got to stick to your own. Yeah, yeah. All right, so I, I got I got a personal question for you. I noticed that. Yeah, you should brush twice a day. <laughs> always. <laughs> <laughs> what? Okay, so this was a great example. I, I was on the Tom Wood show just the other day. <laughs> And I don't think I laughed a single time. And then I was like, wait a minute. I was on Matt Lewis podcast a week before that. I don't think I laughed once. <laughs> then I was on the Matt Develop podcast, the Ground Up show. I don't think I laughed. I don't know if I laughed on the Minimalist. And I'm like, wait a minute. I only laugh on this podcast. Is it because I'm only funny on office hours? Like, why is my funny? Contextual. Why is my sense of humor so contextual? Okay. That's my question submitted to office hours. Occam's razor. The simplest explanation. Is usually <laughs> that what, is, what is the one thing all those other experiences lack? <laughs> okay. That this one has. Right, 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 right. I mean, you're, you're, you're there, but we're talking about my funny. Are you saying that you're like but you said Magic you're Johnson, laughter. you bring out the Absolutely. funny? Absolutely. <laughs> I am the John Stockton of joke. Like, you are Carl Malone. You cannot. You're a pathetic excuse for yourself in my absence. When you go on those other podcasts, it's like when Malone was on the Lakers chasing that ring, and it was just said. He played himself out of the Hall of Fame. When you were with me, the, the Utah Jazz, I'm this little white guy that nobody really so, so, so has, but my, my I humor turn you like, into the mailman. You deliver time and again. You make me look like a comedic all-star. That's what you're saying. Yes. No, honestly, that's a good question, though, TK, because I've wondered often... You know, one of my like little hobbies is trying when I see something in people that not uh, not everyone else sees is yeah. trying to help the world see what I see. For some yeah. reason, I have a ton of fun with that. Yeah, and so like there are things about you, there are <laughs> levels of brilliance, humor, insight that I feel like I get from you on the regular when we're having conversations, Voxer, whatever, and that's part of the, the impetus for this show and the previous in, incarnation on the on my my old podcast. But like, and then when I hear you talk elsewhere, I'm like, why is that version of TK like, it's like not as funny. It's like flatter. It's a little too serious. Or it's like, 
Like, dang it, he needs me. Every talk you give, I need to be up there. I'll prompt you with questions, and I'll pull out the greatness. <laughs> I, I, I need to bring you on as my hype man. So the next time I go on a podcast, yes. I'm like, I, I'm going to bring Isaac just to sit on his side. No, I'm going to be like, like, kind of like a lawyer or an agent. I'll be like, um, yeah, Matt, develop, j- just... I'm going to ask you to back up, take that question back. TK, you're not going to answer that question. You're going to answer this question instead. Go ahead. Can you do it in the voice of the ladies' man? So, uh, yeah. Uh, that question is just wrong. That is just disgusting. So we're going to go ahead and substitute a better query. Um, All right, we got to get to some real no, questions, no, I gotta man. I've got to ask you, though. What's up? When you listened to those and you said that you didn't laugh or whatever, like, what is your take? Well, I wasn't disappointed in myself. Do you think that's just your true self and right now you're faking it? <laughs> no, honestly, what's your take? <laughs> I feel like that was the most loaded question ever. <laughs> I can't I just, win I just, either way. I seriously, I genuinely want to know because I hadn't, I hadn't thought of that. Probably because yeah. I don't listen to you on podcasts. Yeah, but yeah. I, I, no, I hadn't thought of that. And like the the fact that you noticed it is interesting. Yeah. What's your theory on that? Yeah. So first, I wasn't disappointed with myself. I didn't feel like. That's not the real me. I just noticed it this time. I'm like, wait, I actually didn't laugh because I'm, I'm so used to a lot of the don't stuff. Don't worry, that we're I'm doing. not going to shackle you by telling you it's okay. You did a good job. <laughs> Nor are you going to challenge me to realize my full comedic <laughs> no, potential because no. you don't believe I don't in it. I want to manipulate you. <laughs> no, but what no. would you think? So I, I've always experienced my sense of humor as like this highly contextual thing. So around my brothers. <clears throat> uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I've always uh, experienced my sense of humor as a highly contextual uh, intellectual exercise. There are uh, very specific parameters uh, that must first be established. But what is funny? <laughs> like the Morpheus of humor. Yeah, so around my brothers, I'm just very silly, right? I had this childhood friend who, like, he was able to get me to laugh like, like nobody else. There are certain people they're just either really funny to me or they have a way of reflecting me back to myself that makes me laugh, right? So when you imitate my voice for the Welcome to the Office Hours podcast, I don't believe I sound like that, right? But it's funny to me when you tell me that's what I sound like to you and I laugh, right? But I don't get that all the time. So I just think there are certain, I haven't like mapped it out or anything, but I just think there are certain personality types when I get around those people their, my laughter, my my comedic, my, my comedic side, because I'm still not the one making people laugh, but my sense of humor is activated. I guess here it is, man. Here it is. Here's the answer. It's not easy to make me laugh. I, I, like, I love stand-up comedy, for instance, and one out of 10 comics actually makes me laugh. I can watch a whole episode, like a whole like special, and just be like, okay, that wasn't funny. It was lighthearted, <laughs> but it wasn't funny. But w- when, when I have a comedian that really makes me laugh, it's such a, I'm so grateful for that Wait experience. Wait so 30 minutes in when you haven't had your first laugh, you continue watching <laughs> yeah, the rest of yeah. it in case there's something <laughs> yeah. in there. Um, okay, I'm going to have one more comment on that and we'll move to the questions because I feel like this is a very narcissistic show opening. It's just <laughs> yeah. us talking about it's us. Pretty, it's like, it's like the, it's what, pretty therapeutic what journalism right now. devolves into, like journalists talking about other journalists. Um, <laughs> but you did for a Praxis event a, a year or two ago, you like open with a little stand up comedy bit. Yep. You were in this like brief phase where you're like, I'm going all in with stand up comedy. Yep. I'm, I'm going to yep. study it. I'm gonna... And it was excellent. It was hilarious. <laughs> it was brilliant. The people loved it. So you definitely have the the potential. Okay. Feels weird being that complimentary to you. So we got to move to something. <laughs> to some, we have some questions. Yeah, man. And what, what's really cool about the uh, two we got on board today is they're from Praxis participants. Um, and those are the people who inspire this show. That's why it's called Office Hours, because in the Praxis program, we do office hours where the advisors make themselves available for sessions for participants that that, that kind of want to workshop a particular issue and, and go into it. And so, um, you know, we've been having a lot of really peop- really cool people out there listening to us, submitting questions, but this one I wanted to focus specifically. That's how we started. This was just an internal yeah. thing for Praxis participants, and we decided to, yep. to open it up. All right, so too long, didn't read versions of both questions, and then we dive into them with full context. Number one, how do I balance doing great work with needing to meet deadlines? Um, I guess I don't see a conflict. <laughs> yeah, same. Uh, mine is embrace the deadline. Yeah. I, I guess I put it this way. 
greatness can exist uh, absent constraints. Woo! I love it. Number two, too long didn't read version. How do I balance my initial excitement over a project with the annoyances of having to deal with demands along the way? Mm. I wish I would have read these ahead of time. Um, I think having faith in your previous self, uh, and I'll explain. Yeah, man, that was, that was going to be mine. I, w- I would say, uh, see, when you don't prep, you think like me. Yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> we're that's we're what... like twins when I don't do any preparation. <laughs> yeah. This is what it feels like to be TK. <laughs> <laughs> to not think about what I'm going to say ahead of time. You're, you're going to prep a bunch, and then you're going to come in and be like super rude to me. And like, come on, let's get some, it's going to be amazing. Go reversal. Yeah, mine is just learning to get excited about the demands. All right, let, let's get into these questions here. Number one, I'm working on, on my About Me elevator pitch video. I don't have any experience with video creation or editing, so there's a learning curve. But at the same time, I'm excited to showcase my design creative skills in a new way. I have a vision of how I want my final project to turn out, but I know being able to achieve that vision is going to take a lot more time with this project due to my lack of experience with the skills necessary to produce a video. So. I question going a simpler route with the production versus going all out to reach per- per- perfect artistic vision. How do I strike the balance between handing in work you're proud of, especially creative work, while still working under tight time constraints and developing the necessary skills to do the work that's making the process go slower? So here's the, here's the good thing. Uh, Thanks, Juliana. Yes, thanks, Julian. Yeah, so but by the fact that you interrupted me to say that, even though I didn't know who submitted the question, you may, you implied that I was not going to thank her <laughs> and that you're the nice one. Well done. Um, Juliana, I also think that that's really awesome you submitted that question. In fact, I'm more grateful than TK. Yeah, I um, think we like to appreciate the people that listen to the podcast. I just want to appreciate <laughs> all the listeners out there. So, um, the, oh, the good news is... <clears throat> In the real world, you can do both, right? Mm -hmm. So in the sort of artificial setting of school, for example, where it's like, okay, get this assignment in by this date. And if it's an assignment you don't care about and has no value for you beyond once the grade is over or the class is over, it's like, well, I've got to get it in by the deadline. And so I guess I'll just do the best I can and get it in by the deadline and then just be mad that it wasn't as good as it could have been if I had more time. Luckily, the real world's not like that. So you got a deadline, do the best you can to make sure it's done by the deadline, and then do a better version and mm-hmm. update it later. Like if it's an elevator pitch video that you're putting on your Praxis profile mm-hmm. to show employers and whatnot, you make the best one you can to get it done in the, in the module you're in, get that deliverable there, get the feedback on it. And then you go immediately start working on another one. And the more you sit on it and look at your video and feel what it's like to send it around, you might actually get some clarification on how you want to make version two better. So it's like this with a website or whatever. Like nobody likes their website ever. Like maybe everybody likes it for about the first week after they rebuild it, right? And then you immediately start to see things you wish were better. Get the first version out there, start to make a mental list of ways you would improve it while you're working on the second version, then do the second version, right? So that's sort of the, the, the quick thing. But the thing about constraints and greatness, like you can't, I don't think you can do great work if you have this like vacuum of no constraints. Like, okay, I have no time constraints, no money constraints, no anything, no topic. I can make a video about anything I want to, and I'm going to make the greatest video on earth. Nothing will ever get done. You have to have some kind of constraint as an impetus to action uh, and as a way to sort of, you know, limit the limitless choices you could make. And that's a good thing. There's a really cool TED Talk. I'm sure I've referenced it several times from years ago called uh, Embrace the Shake. And it's kind of about this Mm. idea of how constraints can actually enhance creativity if you don't know what to do. And so deadlines can work in that same way. It can actually be a really inspiring thing. Like, okay, what's the best possible thing I can do between now and when that deadline comes? And let's push it and let's see how much we can get away with and what can we, you know. um, and I, w- I wouldn't sweat it too much, but I would never see it as like, it's done, it's finished, I'm not proud of it, I can never do it better again. Like, you, you normally can, uh, and, and you should. Yeah, so I mean, I agree with that completely. I, I think you have to look at your deadlines as, as the catalyst for the greatness that you seek. Um, you need skin in the game, and what gives you skin in the game is the pressure to ship by a, by a certain time. Think about it this way, let's say, you want to be a good writer and all you do is write in your journal 
so that you're the only one who sees it. And let's say you look at something and you know that what you wrote today is mediocre. Well, it's like, okay, no, there's no cost to that though. It hasn't affected your reputation. There's no risk. No one's going to be like, oh, you really want to be a writer? So how motivated are you to get better? Well, you have some intrinsic motivation and that matters, but do you need to be better by tomorrow? No. If you're busy tomorrow and you don't have time to write, you don't really have to. Do you need to be better in a week? Not really. You can take your time with it. There's no difference between a week and a month. It's all up to you. You know your writing's mediocre. Whenever you're ready, take your time. And that's what it's like when you have an indefinite amount of time. You can just keep on investing and getting better and getting better at your own little pace. But when you have a deadline that says, you got to ship that tomorrow, now you have to let the world see you at at that stage where you are as good as you can be by tomorrow morning. And when you submit that, there's a cost. Like you can feel the pain of knowing that you just allowed the world to see a part of you that isn't as beautiful and creative as you know it can be. And if you know you gotta come back again and do that tomorrow, you're gonna put in the work, you're gonna hustle, and the incentives for getting better kick in. It's the whole idea of playing with fake money. Like, you can learn a few investment principles in the abstract if you play around with a fake $100 bill, but if you play around with a real $5 bill, it's just gonna be a lot more meaningful, and when you know the loss can be real, you're gonna work hard at it. Um, you know, I, I experienced this with just, um, like, when, when in, in my acting, when, when you have to memorize a script. It's like if you try to just like memorize the whole script, it takes forever. It's so hard. But if you, if you try to memorize something and then you try to go off the script and you try to say it, you get it wrong. But then when you go back to the script this time, you remember it. It's like the brain processes information a lot more efficiently when you try to do something with it a little bit before you're ready to do that. And, and that tension that you feel allows you to come back and pick up on everything a lot more effectively. I want to throw in one more concept that's pretty simple, but I think is really powerful to be reminded of. And that's the idea of diminishing marginal returns. So mm -hmm. when it comes to the question of how much should I just ship it and get it out on time and how much should I really put into the production values, make it amazing, it, you know, and, and you've got to decide what the, the trade-offs are for you, but there is, you know, say you get something to 95% quality. And that's going to take you, let's say, 10 hours. Typically, the way it works is to get that last 5% or maybe four because you can never quite get it to 100 is going to take you like three hours or something, some inordinate amount of time for that really small final percentage. And the payoff for that final little bit of perfection is usually really, really low. So we used to, I used to work with somebody who was an amazing writer and editor, and we would put out like a newsletter or whatever. And we would write it and get it ready to go, get it drafted up, and it'd be 80% good. Yeah. or 90% good. Yeah. And she would spend a ton, a very high value time, because she had high opportunity costs with other activities she could have been doing, getting it from 90% to 95%. And it wasn't worth it. That additional 5% of quality yeah. was not nearly worth the cost that she put in in terms of the return you get. So like, mm -hmm. you know, you're gonna get the bulk of the returns from that first chunk of getting it 80% of the way there. And so you just need to be mindful of that. Like if you tend to be a perfectionist anyway, just make sure you're comparing that activity of getting it to 95, 99% to what else you could be doing. And sometimes it even sends really high quality stuff can even send a negative signal if it's something that's not super important. So let's say you're in a job and you've got to, hey, send mm -hmm. out the uh, all team newsletter this week. I want you to do the layout in MailChimp. And it's just a newsletter internally. It's usually unformatted. It's kind of very informal. And you're going to format it this week. You get content from the CEO or whatever, and you put it in and you're going to send it out. And you spend 10 hours making the graphics amazing, perfect. It could actually send a bad signal. It could be yeah. like, how much time did they spend on this? What else could they have been doing? So yeah. I don't think that's a problem for a lot of people if you're actually shipping it, but if you are creative and perfectionistic, think about diminishing marginal returns. Yeah, it's so important to pay attention to the question, who am I creating this for? Yeah, you're the creator, so you're partially doing it for your own fulfillment, but what do you want the finished product to do for you, and what are their standards? Because we can put a lot of pressure on ourselves to be perfect or brilliant in this specific way, and we're completely detached from you know, what somebody else values and they may not care about the thing you're going to spend an hour, extra hour on. All right. Thank you, Juliana. Question number two. I basically said the same thing, but I think I had to have the last word. Uh, you did. <laughs> but I have one more word that I just thought of. <laughs> 
what helps is to ask the question, what's the cost of being wrong or of, or of having a less than perfect product? And if that cost is really low, then don't worry about it. If it's a very high cost, and in some situations it is, like if you're doing a corporate accounting, you know, the cost of getting the books wrong could be scandal and you know, prison. So you want to really put in the time to get it right. But that's a, that's a good question. Sometimes it turns out the cost is very low. Yeah, and also, well, it, yeah. Uh, also, you want to make sure that it's worth doing. Uh, okay, let's move on to the next question. We bring the nuts and bolts. <laughs> All right, so I'm, I'm curious about your thoughts on saying more creative. laughter right there than your last four podcast interviews combined. <laughs> Stockton, <laughs> I'm curious about your thoughts on staying creative and excited about projects rather than looking at them with deadlines in mind. Essentially how you keep pro- projects projects and not work. For example, I agree to help a friend film a video and I am genuinely excited to film it. Soon he starts throwing deadlines at me and bugs me daily about it. I start thinking about the project as work and the stress dampens my creativity. Man, I can't think of any project that I would want to not think of as work. Does mm. that make sense? Yeah. Yep. Like work means it's a little more stressful and it's a little less like, yay, fun, but it also means it's serious and fulfilling. And so when I find that that happens, this, this happened, actually just happened recently. I was asked to write a, a contributed chapter to a book that's coming out. And the book title and topic and the chapter topic were really exciting. And I haven't, you know, been writing day, I haven't been doing my daily blogging for the last couple months for for other reasons that we don't need to get into. But um, so I was excited. I was like an opportunity to really write. And I'm like, awesome, but I'm busy the next couple of weeks. I'm going to put it off and I'm going to start writing it. You know, I had a month or something to get it in. And then as it sat there and I knew there was a deadline coming, it slowly morphed in my head from something I was really excited to go like, when I have a couple hours, it's going to be a fun activity after yeah. I do all this sort of to-do list every day. It became another to-do. It morphed into something that stressed me out, that hung over my head, whatever. And I find that often there's one cure for it and one cure only. Do it. And I just go and I start doing it. Yeah. And it's like, oh, this is a chore. I got to make myself do it. 10 minutes in, I was loving it. It was fun. It was mm-hmm. still a challenge. I still had to keep on task. But I, I think, at least for me, it's very hard to have things that, again, that are open-ended or without constraint or sort of like, hey, this is a fun weekend project. If I don't give myself some artificial impetus or whatever, and it does turn into a kind of work, and it does create a little stress if yeah. I'm not working on it, yeah. like it's not really very fulfilling. So my suggestion would be this project you're working on with your friend, just give your schedule an hour a day for three days, whatever time slot you have where you just make yourself do it like work and don't ask it to be fun. Don't ask of this project that it be exciting. Don't ask of it that it not feel like work. Just make it happen and then start doing it. And I bet you'll enjoy it when you start. And you'll certainly enjoy it when you finally ship it at the end of the day. That's that's my take. Like, yeah. why run from the fact that it's not fun? Embrace it. Embrace you know, the suck. Uh, um, Stephen Pressfield kind of gets into this a little bit, too, with the War of Art, how it's almost as if the the ultimate quest for the artist is to try to make their art feel like it's not work. And, and he's basically like, that's the problem right there. You'd be a lot more prolific as an artist if you actually did treat it like your job. He who, says, who, who's the writer that said, uh, I only write when I feel inspired. Yeah. Fortunately, inspiration strikes every morning at 8 a.m. Yeah, 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 I, yeah. I love that. And, and he, he has this, um, I, I think there's this list in The War of Art where he says things like, like eight benefits or something like that of treating your art like you do your day job. And he, he has all these things that we do. He says like, when you're sick, you're scared to call in and you show up to your day job anyway. He goes, even when you're emotionally checked out and you don't want to be there, you still kind of mail it in, but you go through the motions and get some things done. It's only 25% of what they pay you to do, but you get some things done. It's it's not a zero day. Uh, and you have all these different ways that you show up. And if you learn to look at the creative stuff more like that, you'd go from being one of these creative people who only works when they're fulfilled, which is hardly ever at all, or like every 30 days or so, um, to being one of those people that gets things done and you get to experience the fulfillment that comes from having created it. But here's something else I would say, man. I wanted to zoom in on something you said. You said, I agree to help a friend film a video and I'm genuinely excited to film it. Soon, he starts throwing deadlines at me and bugs me daily about it. That's a problem. 
Um, you should never have anyone throwing deadlines at you after you've agreed to do a project. If they're throwing deadlines at you afterwards, you have to look at that as a failure on your part to properly frame expectations. Part of making an agreement is not just saying, yes, I will do that, but coming to an agreement with that person about when a reasonable time frame you know, is for getting it done. And you can disagree about that, but you gotta disagree up front. So if you say, yeah, I can make you that video, um, given what I have on my plate right now, it'll take me three, three weeks. And your friend may say, that's unreasonable. How about one week? Well, that's the time to debate it because you haven't agreed to do it yet. Um, but once you agree to do it, there shouldn't be any throwing deadlines at you because that's part of the agreement itself. And also, you should consider it a loss anytime someone has to call you or text you or email you and say, how's that project going? Um, maybe the first time or two, you can treat that as a learning experience. Okay, I know a little something about the person that I'm dealing with and how frequently they like to be updated. But you gotta take charge of that and say, I'm not gonna let the people I have agreements with be in the dark about what I'm working on and the progress that I'm making. And so I'm gonna beat my friend to that. And I'm gonna say, hey, FYI, this is what I'm working on this week. And this is the next time you'll hear from me. Uh, if you do that, you'll experience those deadlines less as a kind of, less as a kind of imposing thing that you're reacting to involuntarily, and you'll experience it as just another expression of your creativity. Okay, I'm gonna go on a little rant here hmm. about working with other people on projects. And I was gonna say young people, you need to listen up, but it's beyond just young people. But I will, I will say it's time to be a professional and stop being an amateur. And I can't tell you how many times I have been on the side of the equation where I'm somebody, I say, hey, would you wanna work with me on this project and create this thing? And they say, yes. And then I say, great, can you get me this by Tuesday and this by whatever, whatever? And then they just ghost. Or they just, you know, yeah, cool, let's do it. Let's talk sometime. Or sure, I'll take a look. Right, like just this vague abstract, let's keep it all loose and as a potential open, grow up. Okay? Or disagree if with you right do, there and not say it. Right, exactly. If yeah. you are going to work on a project with someone, even if it's just something fun with your friends, hey, we should go to the beach sometime and film a video of us throwing the Frisbee around. Yeah, let's do it. Be the one who professionalizes this and, and cr says, okay, great, when can we schedule it? What's a good date for you? I'm gonna send you a calendar invite. I'm gonna make sure I have my equipment. And if they're like, whoa, 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 I'm not ready yet. Okay, when will you be ready? Well, I don't know, let's play it by ear. Like again, I mean, there are some social things if you really don't care about the outcome, but if you care about the outcome and your reputation, grow up and professionalize a little bit. Don't be an amateur about this stuff. The number of times where people have said, yeah, I'd love to work with you on this, and then refuse to ever get concrete. And so like I have, have learned to be very upfront. I'd love to work with this. I need it by this date. You know, is that something you're able to do? And if someone's like, yeah, I think that's, that should work fine. Then I'm like, okay, for sure. I'm sending you an invite. Confirm that you'll have the first draft by this time. And you know, often you'll still be like, yeah, yeah, it should be cool. And it's like, no, that should, it either is or it isn't. Like, right. do this project or don't. Don't be in this state of unbeing. Like, become solid and concrete and a real person with real accountability and outcomes. And, and I think that's, again, to this idea of like projects that are for fun, whatever. Well, part of the fun is that it's not this commitment. Then it's nothing. Then it's ephemeral. Then it's just pretend. Then it's just you pretending you're up to cool stuff without actually committing and getting something done. I know this sounds a little bit ranty because I've had so many personal experiences that make me bitter at this, but I truly think you're doing yourself a disservice if you keep it in that abstract, I'll get around to it, I don't want to have deadlines, I just want to, let's just do it whenever we can find a time. I, I think an analogy that I use often with our, our practice participants is relevant here, that it's like shorting your own stock. Because if there's something you could do today or even something you could nail down and define today, but you just put it off for tomorrow, you're kind of implicitly assuming that a unit of your time tomorrow is gonna to be worth less than it is today. And that's to short your own stock. You should be getting more valuable all the time. You should be adding to your value so your opportunity cost gets higher. So a minute of your time today should be worth less than it's gonna to be tomorrow. So get on it, nail it down, structure it, take ownership and say, okay, we're doing this project together. What are your expectations so we can get them on the table? And I'll let you know my availability and let's come up with a game plan that we can stick to. And if anyone's gonna deviate, I'm going to initiate communication letting you know that there's some deviation in that. It's not that big of a deal. Just do it. 
Man, and you know, it's a really self-interested thing. Like when you say professionalize, you're not speaking from a morally superior position of like, it's time to just be an adult because I'm sick and tired of 19 year olds not taking responsibility. Like, no, like this actually contributes to your happiness. It reduces stress. Directly. It, 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 it makes you less subject to other people's control. Like when, when you don't frame the expectations properly, you do become the kind of person where other people now have the power to be like, chop, 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 yeah. chop. And, and that's no place to be. Just like set it up. And I, I like what and you and said about- you've got those stressors and things hanging over your head. Your friend emails you all of a sudden and says, where is it? That should never happen because you should yeah. have defined ahead of time, what are we doing? What's the schedule? And you don't have those unknowns hanging over you. Sorry, I cut no, you No, no, you're all good, man. So, so um, yeah, this is my rant. <laughs> <laughs> you had your rant. <laughs> but you know, like when, when you said, uh, yeah, that should be cool. That should be cool. You should so never say that. And I, I've had some people say, well, what if I'm not entirely sure? I mean, they say it's a week and I think I can do it. It really should be cool, but I'm not perfect. It is possible that things could happen and it could take 10 days. And my, my, <laughs> my response to it is actually no. Um, if, if, you need, if you need to account for variables, then you should build that into the agreement. If, if you don't know for sure you can deliver in a week and another person's asking for a week and you think, well, it could be 10 days, then you need to come back and say, I can get it done in two weeks. And now they get to be the ones to say, all right, never mind, I'll look for someone else, or okay, I can work with two weeks because you're the best person for this job. But you've gotta pick a date, even if it's less flattering, that you know you can have it by with all those variables accounted for. But never say, it should be cool. Like, Say you know, say what you know. You can back up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the the question was a little bit more on how do you maintain a level of excitement with something that you committed to once it stops being quite as fun down the road, or at least that was part of the question. And, and my TLDR answer was, you know, have faith in your in your past self, and that's. I think something I've, I've brought up many times this concept, the idea of faith, not as not as belief in something in the absence of evidence, but of belief in when you were of a clear mind and you made a decision about something or you formed a belief about something, later when you're not of a clear mind, when you're feeling emotional or distracted, having faith in your previous decision. And so with commitments like this, like there's a reason you committed to this project and when you get into it and it stops being fun and you're wondering, have faith in your former self. Like, no, I, I made a decision to do this and even though I can't feel the same excitement I felt then, I'm gonna trust, I'm gonna have faith in my former self for having the excitement to do this. Now your former self isn't always right, but I think it's better to have faith in that and err on that side and figure out if you were right by completing it and then you get the self-knowledge of interesting. I wonder why I thought it was cool at first but it ended up not being cool. Then yeah. if you just quit, then you never actually get that self-knowledge, you never know. And so I think there's something here about reminding yourself like, you know, I chose to commit to this because something in it excited me. Now, I don't feel that excitement now, but I'm going to have faith in my former self. And I think it's like this with anything, with long-term relationships. Like, what do I do if, like, it's no longer always fun and exciting to hang around with my wife? You know? It's yeah. like, well, if you think it's always going to be, I got news for you. You know? Like, this yeah. is a different kind of thing. You know? If, if you yeah. want to commit to something long-term, remember that you committed for more than just, eh, as long as it's fun. You know? This reminds me of the I did it for you speech in Breaking Bad. Um, where his wife just calls him on it. You know, he's going through this martyr speech of like, I did it for you. All of this stuff that I went through, all of this stuff I put our family through, I did it for you. And she let him have it. Like, no, I never asked you to do this. Mm -hmm. Like, you did this for you. And like, you need to just own it. For the first time in your life, you need to own it. And, and I think it's easy for us when we, when we set out to do something that we clearly chose to do and we encounter resistance, we go through the dip, it's easy to get to a point where you feel like, yeah, I'm making all these sacrifices for my boss. You know, like you're not taking a check or something, right? Like, or, or, or you know, like, 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 like there's a law that's, that's been passed against you quitting on that day, right? But, but we can talk ourselves into believing that we are victims of things that other people would have us do. We are victims of stuff like, oh, I gotta do. And we even talk about this about day jobs that we don't have a problem with. Yeah, I gotta go to work, you know, time to go in for the man. It's like, no, like you gotta remember why this is free, not just so you can stop whining about it, but 
so that you can so that you can embrace this awesome opportunity that you are the one who chose, right? Like this might be a really awesome opportunity that you forgot about because you were so deep in the weeds, you tricked yourself into thinking that it's something that you had to do. That, that's a big part of staying excited and motivated. Have you ever tried these, and I'm not like a stickler about the language people use, I think just common understanding is fine, but have you ever tried these kind of games or challenges for yourself where like, I'm not allowed to use words like I have to yeah. or I must. I'm only going to use words I choose to or whatever. Yep. And like, if you do, it's a really interesting exercise, a very big challenge in, in self awareness, self knowledge, and also creativity. So, like with work, I find this with my kids sometimes like, Dad, will you come to the park with us today or whatever? Now nah, I got to go to work. And I'm like, Yeah, but I, my relationship to work isn't like that. I said that maybe just out of habit, maybe that's because of what people say, or maybe because it's easier to tell my kids, I, I would rather be with you, but I have no choice than to say, no, I'm choosing to go into work today instead of go to the park with you, right? And like, that's really what's happening. I'm choosing to go to work, not because I don't love my kids, but because in the whole realm <laughs> of all the costs yeah. and benefits, yeah. the value of going to work at this time, accomplishing the things I need to, to get the business where it needs to, to make sure that we have the income that we need and that I'm doing what I want to in the world and I want to be the kind of dad that pursues his dreams and models that for them. And I think that's more important than this hour at the park today, yeah. right? And yeah. so if I don't allow myself to say I have to, to my kids, I have to be like, you know, no, I'm going to go into work instead. Why do you always want to go into work instead of, you know, hang out with us? <laughs> well, I, you know, like, uh, 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 it's really challenging. Because uh, that is my priority, it's, it's not actually my passion. Challenging. Yeah. And, I, and I've tried it sometimes. With, with, you know, with the younger kids, it's if they're like below the sort of age of reason, at least six, seven or eight or whatever, I don't think it really is that useful. But with, you know, with Nolan or whatever, um, I will. It'd be like, you're, you know, you're always just like working on your laptop, even when you're at home. Shouldn't you not be working when you're at home? I said, I'm not working. I'm just doing what I want to do. Like, what are you doing right now? Well, I'm, you know, drawing. Why are you drawing? What if I said, well, quit working? Why are you working? You shouldn't be working. He said, well, I'm, I'm drawing. I'm like, but are you, you know, working on a specific drawing? Yeah. I said, I'm working on something too. And it's just as fun for me. And it's a choice I want to make. Like, now if like, you know, the house is burning down, I would stop working to, you know, to stop that or something lesser. But at any given moment, I've got a whole range of choices in front of me and I'm going to choose the one that kind of has the, the highest valued mix of things that I think help me pursue the broader goals and fulfill my broader responsibilities to the family, to myself, to my dreams, you know, financially, whatever, as well as feel fun and enjoyable in the moment. And there's always going to be some trade-off and I'm not always going to get it right. Now, of course, you don't always have time for this lengthy conversation, but it's a very interesting challenge yeah, if you try yeah. to present yourself with it and say, I'm not allowed to use inaccurate language that portrays me as a victim when really I'm not. There's always some yeah. level of choice. Even if it's a choice between two things you wish you didn't have to choose between, you're still choosing. Yeah, yeah. See, see I believe that the relationship between... I'm just going to look directly at you now. We're going to have a holy moment. <laughs> I believe that the relationship between living freely and, and using language that... It's hard to separate those things, harder than we think. Mm. Um, and, and I think playing games with language like this is a necessary component of opening up new possibilities for, for where we can go in our minds and, and, and how we can change our behavior. But we, we confuse two very distinct things, and this is what prevents us from doing this kind of thing more often. We confuse being morally bad for using language in a certain way with being practically, uh, you know, mm. ineffective, right? So if I say, hey, don't speak about work in the language of necessity, speak about it as if you're free, what will we do? Well, we'll defend ourselves by saying, well, I, well I'm not, that's just how I'm talking. I mean, I, I'm not a bad person. Like, like, who are you, the language police? And we defend ourselves as if a moral accusation has been made. But it's not a moral issue. There's nothing wrong with speaking lazily or not choosing your words carefully, as long as you're not hurting anyone with that, whatever. But that's not the question. The question is, what happens to the way I think about things if I choose to be more conscious of the words I use to describe them? Like, and, and to be open-minded enough to conduct an experiment with that. And I think if you do that, you'll find that changing your language actually makes you more conscious and deliberate in your thinking. I don't think it's possible to do an experiment like, I'm not gonna speak in the language of necessity for two straight weeks without learning some very valuable things about yourself and changing the patterns of thought. Yeah, I think there's, changing the way you speak about things definitely has some impact on 
altering the way you think about them. But I think if it were e- that easy, where you could just start using different language and you would see the world differently, like to a really deep level, um, we'd be doing it a lot more. I think the main value is revelatory. So it's almost like it reveals to you yeah. what your actual mindset is. So yeah, it's yeah. almost kind of a test. Yeah. So like, you know, if you say, I'm not going to let myself use the language of necessity, it will reveal to you to what extent does your mindset operate from a place of thinking of things as obligations and necessities and not seeing yourself as the agent, as the one in charge, as the one choosing. And it will reveal to you, mm, oh my yeah. gosh, I see myself as a victim of circumstance way more than I thought I did. And, and again, using not using that language may help you change that mindset a little bit, but I think the bulk of the work happens on a more fundamental level. And then every time you try that language test, like once upon a time, like all of a sudden, if you really change your mindset, your language will automatically change. Yeah. You won't have to, if you really, truly don't ever see yourself as a victim in the world, you won't have to deliberately try to change your language. Yeah. You just won't find yourself saying things like, I have to, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's a very, I don't know. No, nah, man, I, I love it. Hey, we don't have to go, but I'm choosing, <laughs> I am choosing to end the episode. Can I end it with asking you one final question? Um, I'm trying to see if, if that was okay. You said, can I? That wasn't necessity. I'm asking you if you would enjoy it. How's that? Yeah. I okay, would, all right. I would enjoy it. Would you enjoy very it? much. TK, <laughs> would you enjoy being asked a question? It's yeah, very uncomfortable. Well, yes, I would it's very uncomfortable. enjoy it quite a bit. <laughs> What's <laughs> we got Lori laughing in the in the <laughs> studio here, uh, TK? What is what's some idea you've been playing around with or reading about or whatever that's completely unrelated to career self development stuff like that that we've been talking about? <laughs> I know you got something completely unrelated to yeah. praxis or any of that kind of stuff. Yeah. Oh man. Um, well, I, I don't. I don't think anything can be unrelated <laughs> See, to practice. Uh, have you heard of the butterfly effect? <laughs> <laughs> oh man! So it, what's funny is um, you and I. You and I have had a lot of conversations about signaling, and and the context for it has been you know Brian Kaplan's idea of of, of a degree as a signal, and um and our efforts to to teach people alternative ways of signaling. So I've just been thinking a lot about signaling from. As, as, as in the broadest sense possible, right? Like not just how credition, uh, credentials signal, but like what is my phone signal? Like every every object, every possession, everything that we do from how we dress, what is that signaling? How do we use questions as signals? How do we signal in conversations? How is the experience of emoting out loud a signal? Um, and all the different ways that consciously and unconsciously we are organizing the possibilities of our lives and arranging the things in our lives to signal certain things and just being conscious of that. That's just something that I'm trying to wrap my mind around. Uh, it's pretty messy up there, but I'm trying to wrap my mind around that. Yeah. And that's one of those things that like, once you start looking at it, you can never go back and suddenly it becomes this like Panglossian explanation for everything. So like the hmm. Robin Hanson, Brian Kaplan, all, basically any of these, there's like this whole cluster of economists at George Mason University, Pete Leeson, Chris Coyne, Pete Becky. They're really big on this and you start, to, <laughs> pretty soon you start to be like, everything is signaling. Literally everything yeah. is signaling. Like, yeah. why did I put my hand right here? I'm signaling something to myself, to other people. Yeah. And it's efficient. And it's this yeah. efficient way to convey information. And you start to see, like, as an economist, I've s- seen amazing papers on, like, gangs wearing certain types of clothing as, like, an in-group signal to reduce violence. Yeah. And, like, oh, like, sagging your pants actually reduces violence. And, you know, like, you That's start so to see yeah. the... Yeah. And, and, it, and it really starts to break down as, like, an information theory. Like, what mm. is... The world is all information. If you think of your brain, your mind, like everything is an informational input, output. And so, like, in a way, everything is a signal. What is that? Like, why is this wall red? There's a whole bunch of reasons that go into that. What are we signaling? What information are we conveying with that? How is that doing work that's altering the world in a way that maybe, you know, is doing more work than we give it credit for, making things more efficient, communicating in a way that words alone can't? You know, there's like, you you just get into something that's almost too big, you know? Yeah. And it's not just a matter of of self discovery in the sense of, oh, subconsciously, I'm 
trying to signal all sorts of things by the way that I dress or the way that I talk. But what about on the receiving end of signaling? What are all the different ways I am being communicated to and therefore influenced mm-hmm. that I'm not even aware of? That's fascinating. And how and what implications does that have for my thinking of myself as a free chooser? Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. Our our you know ability to make snap judgments, I think almost always is dramatically better than our ability to make long contemplated analysis. So yeah. like let's say you're interviewing a candidate for a job, usually what you think in the first 2 minutes, almost always it's more accurate than what you think in 2 hours of analysis. Wait, and, what do you mean a more accurate reflection of what you believe or more accurate? Um, more accurate of your assessment of whether or not this person is a good fit for what you're looking for. Interesting. Like almost always you you will you you know maybe add to it or like you have a slight red flag and the analysis will help you dig deeper but but you're going to get more actionable information out of that 2 minute or even 2 second gut reaction. Hmm. Then you will again it's the diminishing marginal returns. Like maybe you'll get 90% of the way there in that like first and then the other 10% you'll do with some deep research or whatever. Interesting. Why is that? What are all the things being signaled? By the way the person sits, the way their hair is, the, the sound of their voice, whatever. You're picking up signals that you don't even necessarily know how to articulate in a way. And they're sending signals. And is it conscious, subconscious? Like, yeah. There's so much more communication going on than that which we are explicitly, consciously acknowledging. Yeah, I love it, man. Hey, so with that, uh, who knows all the things that we subconsciously communicated today. And the things that you're communicating with us. (laughs) All right, everybody. Let's let's call it a wrap. (laughs) It's a wrap.